Anthony Dyke spoke with the guys at 365 Sports on uh, Monday. Had some really interesting thoughts. And we're going to talk today about Colorado. Do they have an advantage in the season opener? And is it the element of surprise? How will TCU prepare for a very uncertain Colorado team? That coming up next here on Locked On Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, subscribe to uh, podcast platforms wherever it is you get them in its audio form or audio version. I'm Stephen Simcox, your host. We're going to talk TCU Colorado today. And uh, a few months ago, I did an episode about this game, right, the season opener. And I said, hey, there's a lot of hype around Colorado right now. Obviously, people are very interested in the Dion angle. Um, he's been a great coach at Jackson State, is coming now to the Power 5 level. Uh, Colorado, which will be a future Big 12 opponent, which adds kind of another interesting component to this matchup. But I was pretty confident in saying, like, I think TCU is going to win this game, and I think they're going to win this game handily. I still believe that. I think ultimately when the dust settles, TCU is going to win this game, and they're going to win this game by more than two scores. Um, I think the spread is 18 and a half right now uh, on FanDuel. So, I mean, that's significant, right? It's a significant point spread. But, listen, Colorado is coming off a 1-11 season. I understand that they turned over that entire roster. Uh, but there's a lot of questions about who they are and who they're going to be this year. Um, Colorado fans watched that video. They watched that episode or listened to it, and they were very upset, and they came after me, which is fun. That's what that's what makes college football great. People are passionate about their teams. They care about this. And I think one of the reasons why hiring Dion was a very smart thing that Colorado did is the simple fact that for a program um, that has a proud history, you know, one national title in the 90s, uh, has a lot of great teams, a lot of great players that have come through there in Boulder. They've fallen on hard times. But there is now an excitement and an enthusiasm and a buzz around that place that there hasn't been in a long time because of what Coach Prime brings to the table. Um, and I think there's people that weren't Colorado fans, that weren't associated with the Buffaloes, that are now following the story closely, and are now fans simply because Dion is there. So I think it was a really shrewd move by Colorado. And if you remember when – TCU was going through their coaching search. They interviewed Deion Sanders, and they were interested in what he had to say and what his vision was for, you know, coaching in major college football. But, like, I, I think even with all the change that they've had, it's a lot of roster turnover. It's a completely new coaching staff. I feel like TCU is a really good football team, and I think they're going to win this game. I did, however, though, listen to Sonny Dykes on 365 Sports on Monday afternoon. Um, and I, I really like the guys at 365 Sports, David Smoke, Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, used to work with them at ESPN Central Texas. Garrett Ross, one of their producers, is a really good friend of mine, used to work with him as well. Um, they do a fantastic job covering college football. And they've really taken off on YouTube since, you know, with covering realignment and, and um, just covering college football as a whole. They do an outstanding job. I encourage you to check out their channel. And I'll link uh, the interview that they did with Sonny Dykes here in the YouTube comments. And they talked about a wide range of things. It was like an 18-minute video. But one one thing that caught my attention was Sonny discussed that it's going to be very challenging to prepare for this Colorado team because they just have so many new faces. A brand-new coach, and that's challenging in itself. But TC really doesn't have a frame of reference for what Colorado is going to do in this game. And I think that is the that's the one big advantage – that Colorado has in this matchup is the fact that, you know, Sean Lewis, new offensive coordinator coming over from Kent state was a head coach. There had some high powered offenses. They run up tempo. They spread you out. They throw the ball around. Um, so you can watch, like you can watch that Kent state tape and see what he likes to do, but it, it's hard to hone in on, okay, how's he going to use the personnel at Colorado because the personnel at Colorado is completely different than the team that you played last year. And he said, like, he was like, listen, the, the tape from last year's Colorado team is essentially useless. There's no sense in going back and watching that game that we played against them early in the year, or it was season opener. You know, there's no sense in watching their games from last season 
because they're not going to do anything like that. Not only are they not going to, you know, be in those personnel groupings and play that style of football, the roster is completely overhauled. And um, when I was talking about a few months ago, when I was talking about this game, and I was like, I think TCU is going to win. A lot of Colorado fans were like, you're basing uh, your opinion off last year's team. It's a completely different roster. No, I realize that. Like, I realize this is a completely different roster that Colorado has. They're bringing in like 70 new players, which is insane. My sticking point is I think one TC is just really good and really talented, and they're the more talented team top to bottom. I know Colorado's brought in some great players, um, Shudor Sanders, at quarterback Travis Hunter, the all-world corner who could play both ways, Cormani McClain, five-star corner who was originally committed to Miami and they got him to flip. They did an outstanding job acquiring talent. I don't think they can come together and be cohesive as a unit and, you know, figure this out and just turn this whole roster over and in week one go on the road and beat a really good TCU team. But I think the fact that TCU doesn't have a lot of, you know, frame of reference for how to attack them, what they're going, you know, what they're going to be in on offense and defense, how they're going to try to slow down this TCU attack. um, That is a legitimate concern. And Sonny went on to say like, they're going to have to make adjustments during the game, which that's good news It because Joe Gillespie, TCU's defense coordinator, did an outstanding job last year adjusting in the second half of games. There was that stretch of games, you know, Oklahoma State put up a lot of points against TCU in the first half. They buckled down, they held them to six points in the second half. Kansas State, you know, scored a lot of points against TCU in the first half. Adrian Martinez goes down, Will Howard comes in, and then they figured out how to attack – that offense with Will Howard, and they win that football game. Um, West Virginia, like the defense could not slow down JT Daniels and that West Virginia offense in the first half of that ball game, but they found a way to get stops later in the game. And so we discussed that. He also went on to say, look, it's about we have to focus on ourselves, not beat ourselves, not give up like crazy plays like kick returns or punt returns for touchdowns, take care of the football, don't turn it over, don't have a lot of pre-snap penalties. Don't allow Colorado to gain momentum. Don't give them free scores. Don't allow them to stay in this game by just making silly mistakes. Like, execute well, take care of your business, and that's what they have to focus on. Um, And he also said that he thinks the big – like, he didn't say this explicitly, but it seemed like the big advantage he feels like they have is up front with the offense and defensive line. The physicality that TCU can bring to the table. And, you know, in last year's game, and I realize, like – Listen, last year's game, you kind of throw it out the window. But that was the big difference. Colorado hung around in the first half. TCU didn't play well on offense at all. Darius Davis punt return touchdown was the only thing they had to show for it as far as points go. Had a 7-6 to six lead going into the locker room. But they come out in the second half, and they basically decide, okay, we're struggling to throw the football. We're struggling to get into a rhythm. We're going to run the ball. We're going to lean on this offensive line. And we know we have the advantage from a, a size and physicality standpoint and that's going to be how we win this ball game. And I think, you know, there's there's narratives on both sides of this game that I feel like are overblown, right? Like on TCU side, I've heard a lot about the weather. We're in the middle of just a miserable summer here in Texas. It's I've lived here my whole life. It's like 110 degrees every day. It feels like 115. It's crazy. I like even myself living here as long as I have, I can't I have no frame of reference for how hot it's been. It's just, it's insane. And so it's going to be an 11 a.m. kick. It's going to be hot down there on the field. Um, And I know Colorado has players from all around the country, mostly from the Southeast, but they've been preparing in Boulder. It's going to be a very different environment when they come play here at TCU. But I think ultimately, like, both teams are going to have to deal with the heat. TCU should be better equipped to do that. Um, But to me, that's not going to be, like, the deciding factor in the game. It's simply that TCU – has more experience playing together. They have a coaching staff that has clear vision for what they're going to do. They do have, you know, a wild card as well because Kendall Bryles, even though it's still a a spread offense, it's going to, you know, spread people out, use a lot of RPOs, use the run game. It's different than what Garrett Riley brought to the table. Obviously Colorado can watch what Arkansas has done the last few years, but I feel like it's going to be a different philosophy here because of the personnel This is not just a team that's going to, you know, they can do that. Like they can line up and run the football, but they can also stretch the field. 
get the ball in playmakers' hands, and the speed they have is going to be incredible. I wouldn't be surprised, though, that if in the first quarter, this is a close game, simply because, again, like TCU doesn't have a great feel for what Colorado is going to do. And they're probably not going to know until the game starts and it gets going and they have to decide, okay, how do we attack this, right? But ultimately, I think the depth, the physicality, the size, the speed, and just the top-to-bottom talent is going to prove to be overwhelming for this Colorado team. I do, however, think they have an interesting advantage in this matchup from the perspective of, you know, whether it's Sean Lewis, the OC, or Charles Kelly, the defense coordinator, who has a really good resume and a really good pedigree. He was, he's been in Alabama. That's where, he, you know, he came over from as an assistant defense coordinator and safeties coach. He was at Florida State, won national championship there, won a national championship at Tuscaloosa. And you can watch what he's done at those different stops. But again, it's about how do you um, find a way to understand what they're going to do with this personnel? You, you don't. Like, you don't know how. They're going to use these players, all these new players that they brought in. At the same time, though, Colorado's had, you know, a a whole fall camp now to try to figure that out themselves. But they're probably not going to know fully how they're going to use these guys until game starts. So we'll see what it ends up looking like. But a very interesting and unique challenge that TCU has in front of them as they try to prepare for this football game. When we come back, some more thoughts from that interview He also discussed this offense. What is it going to look like with Kendall Browse calling plays? We'll discuss that more next here on Locked on Horn Frogs. This episode of Locked on Horn Frogs is brought to you by BetterHelp. Um, Man, if you've you've thought of, I need need somebody to talk to. Um, I'm, I'm having anxiety. I'm having stress. I would just love to communicate some of these thoughts and and fears and feelings to someone. Online therapy is a great help, right? Like therapy has been helpful for me. I'm someone like I thought for years, I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm just kind of a worried person. Like that's just my personality. I realized later on in life, no, I think this is a little unreasonable. I feel like I'm someone who deals with anxiety. My wife and I, our two oldest children, we adopted them out of the foster care system. They have a background that includes, you know, some trauma. And so we have, we've, invested in therapy for them and it's been so beneficial not only for them but for our entire family and for the harmony that it brings when you know people have an outlet and people have someone to talk to whether you're dealing with decisions around your career relationships anything else therapy can help you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life trusting yourself to make decisions um, that benefits you and align with your values the more you practice it the easier it gets and if you're sitting there what you know i don't want to go to an office and pay a copay and go through the whole you know, process of finding where to go. Well, the great thing is BetterHelp is online. It's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just have to fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge so you can find out who works best for you. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash college today to get 10% off your first month. Again, that is BetterHelp.com slash locked on college visit that website today and get 10 percent off your first month of online therapy so continue to talk about sunny dykes with on 365 sports which you can go to their youtube channel i'll link the interview here in the comments um and he talked about a, a wide range of topics one of the things that he mentioned that stood out to me because it was very similar to it was very similar to something aj ricker the offensive line coach said a few weeks back when he was talking to the media. A.J. Ricker, the O-line coach, he was asked, like, how different is this offense between Garrett Riley and Kendall Bryles? And he said, listen, there's some similarities, but in a lot of ways it's completely different. You know, the, the main one that stood out is the verbiage is very different. So they're learning a different way to call plays. They're learning all the different checks, all the different responsibilities that they have within the offense. And so that's that's part of it. But he also talked about, how the tempo is really the key that his O line, especially they have to be conditioned very well because this is an offense that is predicated on going quickly, going fast. And it's intriguing because that was something that they sort, that was something that they sort of lost at Arkansas. Like Kendall wasn't running, you know, a play every 10 seconds or 13 seconds. Like he was at Baylor. He kind of, he kind of let his foot off the gas a little bit. I imagine that has a lot to do with, Sam Pittman, his background being, 
you know, more of a uh, let's let's run the ball, let's control the clock, let's play complimentary football. And Sonny said that he said on this inter- in this interview, he's like, listen, the tempo is a big part of what we're going to do. And he said he thought the offense was at their best last season when they were going fast, which kind of caught my eye because, I mean, he obviously has analytics probably to back that up. I'm sure they're charting plays. They're like, okay, this is what, this is what our success rate is when we're going at this speed, when we get into a rhythm in the, in the drive, this is what we're doing. And then also, I mean, he just has a good feel. Like he's done this long enough as a coach that he has a good sense and a good feel for, um, you know, when we're moving at this pace, this is what we do well. This is uh, this is how we get ahead. This is how we catch the defense off guard. And I wouldn't have thought that. I mean, it's not because I didn't think TCU was good at that, but I just felt like they sort of mixed and matched last season. You know, sometimes they were really getting flying and going fast. Sometimes they would slow things down. But he seems to think that the team was at their best, that they were functioning at their best when they were going fast when they were moving at a good clip, when they were putting their defense on their heels. Uh, you know, I remember that Oklahoma State game, right? Like TCU would sub, and then when the offense subs, it gives an opportunity for the defense to sub. And so uh, Oklahoma State was taking advantage of that loophole by waiting until the very last second to sub, you know, sub someone on the field, get someone off the field, and then they were getting delay game penalties called on TCU, and TCU adjusted – by snapping the football while that defensive player was trying to run off and they were getting um, a, a penalty called on Oklahoma State because they had too many men on the field. And so that was a kind of a crazy chess match. But that was one game in particular that I remember where that, that pace was really accelerated. They were trying to get back in the game. And they asked him this question, like the, the piggyback off this question, it started with the, the question about, okay, one rule change this year in college football is the clock is no longer going to stop when teams get a first down until the last two minutes of the half and the last two minutes of the game. So, I mean, that's a big difference. Like, that's a very substantial difference in how they are managing the clock at the college level. It's going to be like the NFL now. And so he said, listen, that's a huge change. And honestly, um, he didn't sound super happy about it, but he said it. one of the great things about college football or one of the um, things that you have to think about in college football is that nobody's ever really out of a game, right? Like even if you're down two or three scores in the fourth quarter, if, you, if you're if you going fast, if you're running a lot of plays, if you're able to score points, you can come back by pushing the tempo and scoring quickly and getting first downs and stopping the clock and extending the game, right? And so that's a, that's a big change this year. Um, but they're going to try to, to have an offense that is going – at a fast pace. And I said this earlier. I was like, listen, this is not, this is not like a magic elixir. Some people get super excited and it, it is exciting. It's exciting to watch an offense that's going quickly. That's decisive. That is a clear plan for what they're going to do. It doesn't mean you're automatically going to be good, right? Like you still have to execute. You still have to play well. You still have to find ways to make the offense work, but it definitely puts a defense on their heels um, and it just gives uh, it gives TCU a chance to kind of always be one step ahead if they can move the chains, if they can find ways to exploit matchups, and it, it really forces the defense to kind of show their hand and keep the same personnel on the field. Um, and he said this is something that Chandler Morris is really comfortable with. You know, it's he ran a, an offense that went at a fast pace when he was at Highland Park playing under Randy Allen, um, that he really likes the RPOs that they have within the offense, the run pass options. He's smart. He's got a good arm. He's accurate. And so this fits what he wants to do really well. But I was I was surprised. You know, he went as far as to say, like, when he was charting out or thinking about, okay, Garrett Riley's leaving. Who, what type of offensive coordinator do I want? What type of person do I want to run this thing? What attributes do I want them to have? And he, the first thing on his list, he said, or one of the first things on his list was he wanted somebody that was going to push the tempo, push the pace. And, you know, like if, if you're, if you don't execute well, and if you go three and out, it puts a lot of pressure on your defense. 
even if you're scoring, if you're scoring really quickly, it can put a lot of pressure on your defense. But, I mean, it also can allow your offense to be really efficient and really good. And TCU is going to try their best to do that at a high level this year. And they have a lot of skilled players, right? A lot of guys that were we are excited about their potential. We think they could be good. And so I would expect a bunch of rotation, you know, mixing in and out, especially with these wide receivers. If you're going to ask them to play a lot, play a lot of snaps, if you're going to ask them to run a lot of routes and, and try to stretch the field vertically, well, then you kind of have to have a revolving door of guys coming in and out of the formation, coming in and out of the, of the game uh, to keep everybody fresh and to keep everybody working at a high level. But TCU, they're going to run this – like they're going to run this offense – at an accelerated pace. And that's one of the questions when we talked to Doug Fairley about this, this offense and what they're going to do. That was one of the questions we had. Are they going to, are they going to sort of go back to what Kendall Browse did early in his career with the tempo, or are they going to, you know, slow things down? And it appears they really want um, to have this thing working quickly. And so we'll see that live and real for the first time when they take on Colorado in the season opener. When we come back, I'll get to some of your thoughts about, uh, our episode from Monday and a TCU baseball note before we wrap up. Again, this is Locked On Horn Frogs. Uh, yesterday on Monday, I chatted with uh, Michael Pevia from the uh, Purple Rain podcast, another TCU podcast, and we handed out superlatives. You know, who's going to be the MVP of this team? Who is going to be the offensive player of the year, the defensive player of the year? the breakout player, the newcomer of the year. And some of you guys had thoughts on this. Um, one uh, one user who goes by the uh, username of Ground Hero, I'm always, I'm always curious and love to see your YouTube names. It kind of catches me off guard when I read it live on the air because I'm like, okay, is this appropriate? Is this, is this fine? But it is. He says, I'm really hoping Jared Wiley gets more uh, possessions. I was surprised they didn't target him more often last year, especially – in short yardage situations. Yeah. I mean, they used him to move the chains from time to time. Um, and that was, that was part of, part of what he did. I think he was also used a lot in the red zone. You know, he had touchdowns, especially early in the season. Um, one thing that Michael brought up yesterday that I, I mean, I, I thought about it before, but I hadn't really mentioned it. Jared's so good at, at the physical part of the game, like blocking. That was what he was asked to do at Texas. And he was asked to do a lot that a lot this year as well. Um, but I think I, I agree with you. Like he could be a really good receiver. I hope that they use him. I think they're going to use him a lot more this year. He sounded very excited at Big 12 Media Days when I saw him and got to talk to him a little bit about what his role in this offense was going to be. Um, and I feel like he is the guy, like if you had to target one player on this team that could benefit the most from an NFL standpoint this season, if Jared Wiley shows the ability to catch the ball, to be consistent in the receiving game, to get yards after the catch, it's going to be huge for his draft stock. Because he can, I mean, he can be an inline blocker. That's something that he can do well. It's really just, are you the complete package? Can you catch the football? Can you make plays? And Jerry Wiley has shown that he can do that in the past. It's just about putting it all together um, this upcoming season. But yes, I think he is going to be a huge factor in the offense this year. And I really hope that's the case. Uh, Blake Murphy says he's looking forward to big things from Joe Gillespie in year two. TCU will need that defense to win them a couple games this year. Um, I think there is going to be a jump, and you hope so, right? Like, they did such a good job as the year went on last season. Last few games were rough, but obviously that was playing great competition. Um, and you you hope that this TCU defense is playing faster, that they understand their assignments better, um, and that that shines through, but also that they're just a more sound, fundamental team. Don't have as many busts, don't give as many big plays. And the secondary, like, I think there's a ton of talent. You do wonder if with all that talent, with that confidence, they take some risks that maybe don't always pay off. But, you know, that's part of the deal too. Um, but, yeah, Blake, I mean, this this defense might have to carry this team a little bit early in the year. You know, there's probably going to be some games that are kind of rough and physical and maybe the offense doesn't fully have their rhythm and they aren't playing at the level that we expected them to. Um, and this defense is going to have to, you know, pick them up and find a way to be successful when that happens and when the offense sort of goes through a rut. Uh, a TCU baseball note before we go. So um, Brian Howard and Evan Scout, two former players, Brian Howard, uh, longtime pitcher for the Frogs, went by the name Big Big Game Howie. 
because they always seem to show up in those big postseason moments. Evan Scow, great catcher for TCU. Uh, both guys made multiple appearances in the College World Series. They're going to return as assistant coaches um, for TCU baseball, student assistants on the coaching staff as they complete their undergraduate degree. Kirk Sarlo says, I can't wait for my players, our players, to be around Brian and Evan on a daily basis. They're two amazing human beings. Both guys spent some time in minor league baseball, but it appears they're ready to hang it up and kind of move on with the next chapter of their lives, and that means – uh, coaching this team, which is which is super exciting. Um, so excited for those players. You know, both were outstanding players for TCU. Scad was an All-American in 2017 and a three-time All-Big 12 performer, played in the White Sox organization for a few seasons, um, started in 198 games in his career and had uh, 36 home runs. Brian Howard made over 62 appearances in his career, I had a record of 26 and five and posted a 3.46 ERA over his career at TCU. Another great frog, great player. And so good to have those guys around, right? As a sounding board for this baseball team. I'm excited about TCU baseball this upcoming season and don't know what the future is going to hold for them as far as coaching, you know, beyond this, but um, good resources to have and just guys that are still really young can hopefully relate to these players, understand what they're going through on a daily basis and be, you know, kind of a, a good uh, place for these players to go outside of obviously like what Kirk Sarloose and NTJ Bruce are giving them, which is going to be great insight each and every day. I try to give great insight each and every day. I'm not sure that I'm doing it, but we're going to give it our best shot. Um, and we'll be back in tomorrow. It's Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team every day.